Health. This is chapter 16 on the blood. So blood is the life-sustaining transport vehicle of the cardiovascular system. So it's going to transport all of the nutrients and gases and waste throughout the body to all of the tissue cells. So some general functions of blood include transport, regulation, and protection. So some of the transport functions of blood include things like delivering oxygen and nutrients to our body cells, transporting those metabolic wastes, things like carbon dioxide, um, to the lungs and kidneys for elimination. Um, they're also going to transport hormones from those endocrine organs to their target organs. Some regulation functions of blood include things like maintaining body temperature uh, by absorbing and distributing heat maintaining normal pH using buffers, um, and maintaining adequate fluid volume in the circulatory system. The protective functions of blood include things like preventing blood loss. So the plasma proteins and platelets in our blood are going to help to initiate clot formation and stop any bleeding. Um, and also preventing infection. So the cells of our immune system are also found in the blood. Right? So these include things like the white blood cells, uh, antibodies, and complement proteins. So blood is actually considered a tissue, a connective tissue. Um, so we talked about this a little bit in Anatomy 1 where we talked about connective tissues um, and that blood was a little bit different from the other tissues and that it's the only fluid tissue in the body. But remember from the levels of structural organization, you know, so cells work together to form tissues. Right? So we have different types of cells working together in the blood to form this blood fluid tissue. So the matrix is the non-living fluid portion called the plasma. Um, so then everything else in the blood are going to be referred to as a formed element. So these are all of the cells um, and platelets in the blood right, that are going to be suspended in this plasma fluid. So the formed elements include the erythrocytes or the red blood cells, leukocytes or white blood cells, and platelets. So if we were to spin a tube of blood um, it'll show us three different layers. So the heavier red blood cells will sink to the bottom of the tube and the lighter fluid plasma will float to the top. Um, so the erythrocytes on the bottom make up about 45 percent of whole blood volume um, and this is referred to as the hematocrit. So this is just the percent of blood volume that's only red blood cells. Uh, the white blood cells in the platelets are in this narrow region in the center. So the buffy coat right, is going to contain your uh, white blood cells and the platelets. Right, so it only makes up less than 1% of whole blood volume. And then, of course, we have the plasma on top that makes up the majority of blood volume at 55%. Uh, and because it is only fluid, it's the least dense component, so it's going to float to the top of the tube. So some physical characteristics of blood. Um, so you all know blood is sticky, opaque fluid with a metallic case due to the iron in the blood. Um, so the color of blood is going to vary with its oxygen content. So the higher the oxygen levels, it'll have a brighter red color. And vice versa, a lower oxygen levels um, would have a darker red color. Um, so pH ranges from 7.35 to 7.45. So slightly basic, still almost pretty close to neutral. Um, but as you can see, very narrow range that if we go just a hair outside of these ranges, um, then we could have things like acidosis, alkalosis, and even death. So blood volume makes up roughly 8% of total body weight. Um, average volume for males is 5 to 6 liters and females is 4 to 5 liters. So we're going to start to look at all of the components of blood starting with the plasma. So he said the plasma was the fluid component of the blood. Um, it's a straw colored kind of sticky fluid that's about 90% water. 
Um, so it's going to contain all of the dissolved solutes in the blood, so things like nutrients, gases, hormones, waste, proteins, ions. Uh, the plasma proteins are going to be the most abundant solutes. So these are um, going to help with blood clotting. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, so they're generally going to remain in the blood. They're not taken up by the cells. Their job is to stay in the blood um, and to assist with blood clotting. And these proteins are produced mostly by the liver. Of all the plasma proteins, though, albumin is the most prevalent one. It makes up 60% roughly of the plasma proteins. Um, so it has a few different functions. Um, one function would be a carrier for other molecules. It um, can also act as a blood buffer um, and helps to contribute to that plasma osmotic pressure. So again, this is showing the different components of blood. So the plasma, we said, was about 55% blood volume. Um, so roughly 90-91% is just water. Um, and then we have a few other solutes, so your ions, nutrients, waste, gases, hormones, um, and then proteins. So these plasma proteins with albumin by far being the most uh, prevalent. So the next formed element we'll look at are the red blood cells. Okay. Um, so of the red of the formed elements, um, only the white blood cells are complete cells. Right. Um, platelets are just cell fragments and red blood cells have no nuclei or other organelles. So most of these formed elements are only going to be able to survive in the bloodstream for a few days. Um, there are some that can last for um, virtually your whole lifetime, some immune system cells, some of your memory cells in your immune system, but for the most part red blood cells, platelets, um, white blood cells aren't going to live very long. Um, and blood cells originate in the bone marrow, so and they do not divide. So new blood cells can only come from the bone marrow. So a, uh, say a white blood cell here is not capable of undergoing mitosis to make more white blood cells like it. So the erythrocytes are the red blood cells. Um, so just a few structural, physical features. So they're small diameter cells that um, function in gas transport. So their shape is um, going to be conducive to that gas transport. So they have a biconcave disc shape, um, and they have no nucleus. So a nucleus means they do not have a nucleus, um, and essentially no organelles. Um, so they're pretty much filled slap full with hemoglobin for gas transport. So that's their only job. And sometimes the diameter of the blood cell can be larger than some capillaries. Okay. Um, but we'll talk about that in the next chapter with blood vessels. So again, everything in anatomy physiology, the whole underlying kind of concept is structure reflects function. So blood cells are very good example of this complementarity of uh, structure and function. So three structural features make these red blood cells very efficient for their gas transport role. So again, this biconcave shape is going to increase the surface area relative to volume so we can pack more oxygen atoms in there. Um, Hemoglobin is going to make up 97% of the cell volume. So like I said, it's slammed full with hemoglobin because we want to transport as much oxygen as possible. And also, they have no mitochondria. So remember, mitochondria is where ATP is produced, so the energy of the cell. Um, but it requires oxygen to make ATP. So the blood cells use... Uh, anaerobic ATP production so that they don't consume the oxygen they transport. So 100% of the oxygen that they transport is going to make it to those tissue cells. So they're dedicated to respiratory gas transport um, using the protein hemoglobin that's going to bind reversibly with oxygen. So hemoglobin consists of the red heme pigment, so that gives uh, blood its red color, um, and it's bound to protein uh, globin. Right? So it's actually four different protein chains, um, 
kind of bonded together to make a large globular protein. Okay. Um, so the heme pigments bonded to each globin chain. So each heme's atom binds one oxygen. Okay. So again, so this means one hemoglobin can transport four oxygen atoms. Okay. So one per heme. So one red blood cell can then have 250 million hemoglobin molecules. Right? So that means one red blood cell can transport up to a billion atoms of oxygen. Hematopoiesis is the formation of all blood cells. So whenever you see the word poiesis or poetic, um, it just means formation of. Right? Um, hemato means blood, so this is formation of blood cells. So this process occurs in the red bone marrow. Um, so in adults, red bone marrow is found in the axial skeleton, so the head and trunk region, the uh, pelvic girdles, and the proximal epiphyses of the long bones. Hematopoietic stem cells, sometimes called hemocytoblasts, um, are the base model stem cell that's going to give rise to all of the formed elements. So red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So different hormones and growth factors are what's going to push this cell development toward a specific pathway. So the production of erythrocytes is called erythropoiesis, so formation of red blood cells. So this process takes roughly about 15 days um, so you don't need to know all of these steps. Just know that it begins from one of these hematopoietic stem cells. Okay. Um, the immature version of the red blood cell is the reticulocyte. Okay. Um, that's then going to mature into a fully formed erythrocyte within two days. Okay. So as you can see throughout the process, the cell is going to lose its nucleus and organelles. Um, to take on this erythrocyte shape. So just like with everything in the body, we have to maintain that kind of homeostatic range or balance. So too few red blood cells can lead to tissue hypoxia where the tissues aren't getting enough oxygen. Um, too many red blood cells can increase the vo uh, blood viscosity or thickness, so the blood can get very kind of sludge-like um, and hinder the flow. Uh, the body makes roughly over 2 million red blood cells per second, and we have to balance the production of red blood cells versus their destruction. So we have to keep that balance so we don't make too many or destroy too many. Right? Um, so this balance is going to depend on things like some hormonal controls um, and dietary requirements. So hormonal control of erythropoiesis um, is dictated by erythropoietin or EPO. So this is a hormone that's going to stimulate the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. So we always have a small amount of this hormone in the blood just to maintain of our basal homeostatic rate of blood cell formation. And it's going to be released by the kidneys um, in response to hypoxia. So again, hypoxia is a lack of oxygen going to the tissue cells. Um, so a few potential causes of hypoxia could be a decrease in the number of red blood cells due to something like hemorrhage or increased uh, blood cell destruction. Uh, we could have insufficient hemoglobin per red blood cell, so example in someone that has an iron deficiency. Um, reduced availability of oxygen, so in high altitudes or if someone has lung problems um, where they just can't get enough oxygen from the air. So too many erythrocytes or a high oxygen level in the blood would also inhibit that EPO production in a negative feedback loop. So EPO can also cause erythrocytes to mature faster, kind of speed up their development, um, as well as testosterone that enhances EPO production. So this is one reason why males have slightly higher red blood cell counts uh, than females.
Okay, so this is showing our feedback loop for erythropoietin and erythropoiesis. So if we lose our homeostasis, so now we have a homeostatic imbalance, right? So our stimulus would be hypoxia, so inadequate oxygen delivery. Um, so again, this could be due to a few different causes, so decreased red blood cells, decreased hemoglobin, decreased oxygen, uh, but they're going to have the same effect in that the kidney is going to be stimulated to release erythropoietin, or EPO. So the EPO is then going to stimulate the red bone marrow where blood cells are made to enhance our red blood cell production and oxygen carrying capacity. So once we restore our oxygen carrying capacity, our tissues are now getting enough oxygen to the cells, we can turn off that erythropoietin production. Now, it's fairly common some athletes abuse artificial EPO um, to increase their red blood cell count, to increase their stamina and endurance when their oxygen carrying capacity. Uh, but it can have some dangerous consequences. So it can uh, increase, like I said, the viscosity of the blood, make it thicker, um, and cause clotting, stroke, or even heart failure. So red blood cells have a lifespan of about 100 to 120 days. Um, being that they are anucleate, or they don't have a nucleus, they can't synthesize new proteins or grow and divide. So they have a definite shelf life for um, as they get older, they start to become more fragile um, and degenerate. So eventually they get trapped in smaller circulatory channels um, and eventually end up in the spleen. So there's macrophages or think large eating cells in the spleen that are going to engulf and break down the dying red blood cells um, and recycle their components for reuse. And so the spleen is like the graveyard for red blood cells. So it's where red blood cells go to die. So as the red blood cells are broken down, the heme pigment, the iron atoms, and the globin proteins are all going to be separated. So we'll store the iron um, for reuse later on. The heme pigment is broken down to a yellowish pigment called bilirubin, where it's then going to be stored in the liver and used to make bile. Um, the globin is going to be broken down into its uh, basic building blocks, these amino acids, and released into circulation, where we can then use those building block amino acids to make new proteins for our cells. Um, so looking at some erythrocyte disorders, most of these are classified as either anemia or polycythemia. So anemia is where the blood has an abnormally low oxygen carrying capacity um, that's too low to support normal metabolism. Um, so generally this is a sign of some other greater problem um, rather than a disease in and of itself. Um, but some symptoms of anemia include things like fatigue, uh, pallor, which is kind of a pale uh, ghost-like appearance, uh, dyspnea, difficulty breathing, um, and chills. So there's three groups of anemia based on the underlying cause. Um, so anemia could be caused by things like just blood loss, uh, there's not enough red blood cells being produced, or there's too many being destroyed faster than they can be replaced. So blood loss anemia would be something like a hemorrhagic anemia. Um, so this would be where the blood loss is very rapid, so a severe wound or injury, um, and would have to be treated with blood replacement, blood transfusion. A chronic hemorrhagic anemia would be a slight but persistent bleeding, so something like a bleeding ulcer. Um, so for this, the primary problem would have to be treated to stop that blood loss. Um, also, we could have anemia if we're not producing enough red blood cells, so something like maybe an iron deficiency anemia. Um, so could be caused by that hemorrhagic anemia, but also just by low iron intake or an impaired iron absorption. Um, so the red blood cells that are produced 
um, are smaller, they're more pale in color um, because they can't synthesize adequate hemoglobin um, due to the lack of iron. So this one would be fairly easy to treat um, with just iron supplements. So here you can see inside each red blood cell we have our hemoglobin with four iron atoms to bond an oxygen. So without the iron in the hemoglobin, the red blood cells are not able to bind any oxygen. Another type of anemia where we may not be producing enough red blood cells is called pernicious anemia. So this is actually an autoimmune disease that um, the immune cells destroy the lining of the stomach. Um, there are certain cells inside the stomach that produce an enzyme called intrinsic factor. So intrinsic factor is required for vitamin B12 absorption. And vitamin B12 is required for red blood cell production. So this could be caused by um, also just a low dietary intake of B12 could be a problem for vegetarians um, but more often than not it has to do with the stomach cells production of the intrinsic factor so this would have to be treated with B12 injections or nasal gels so we couldn't really treat this with B12 supplements because the person wouldn't be able to absorb the B12 um, from the stomach right? because there's not enough intrinsic factor being produced. So this is just showing, um, so the intrinsic factor is going to be um, the blue and say the little pink triangles are your B12. So in order to absorb or carry this vitamin B12 across the um, intestinal lining, it has to have this intrinsic factor um, carrier. Another type of anemia where red blood cells aren't being produced enough would be a renal anemia. So caused by a lack of the EPO. So this often accompanies renal disease. So for whatever reason, the kidneys aren't able to produce enough EPO on their own. So this one we would have to treat with a synthetic form of erythropoietin. Aplastic anemia would be a destruction or inhibition of the red bone marrow where blood cells are formed. So this can be caused by drugs or chemicals, radiation, viruses. Um, so for instance, someone that has their uh, bone marrow or their um, immune system suppressed after say a transplant. All right, so we would want to um, inhibit that red bone marrow from making those blood cells. So because all blood cells are formed in the red bone marrow, it's going to affect all the formed elements. Um, so it results in anemia as well as clotting and immune defects. Right, so we lose our platelets and our white blood cells and our red blood cells. So treatment would be uh, maybe short term with uh, transfusions. Right? Um, a long term treatment would be having to transplant or replace those stem cells. Another type of anemia would be where too many red blood cells are destroyed faster than they can be uh, produced. Um, so premature lysis of red blood cells is referred to as a hemolytic anemia. So again, lytic lysis means to split or break apart. So we're breaking apart, splitting apart blood cells. Right? So premature rupturing of blood cells. So this can be caused by maybe an incompatible transfusion or even an infection. So some viruses um, cause the red blood cells to burst or lyse. Um, hemoglobin abnormalities can also be a cause of this, but that's usually uh, a genetic condition. Um, since hemoglobin is a protein and all proteins are genetically coded in the DNA, um, these are typically going to be caused by some type of genetic mutation um, that affects that hemoglobin protein structure. So thalassemia is one of those genetic uh, hemoglobin red blood cell disorders. Um, so it's typically only found in people of Mediterranean ancestry. Um, so in this one, one of the globin chains is either absent completely or it's faulty and deformed. 
Um, so the result is the red blood cells are more kind of thin and delicate and they're deficient in hemoglobin. Um, so there's different subtypes that range in severity, uh, but in the most severe cases, the person may require monthly blood transfusions. Sickle cell anemia is a little more well known, uh, but this also has to do with a misshapen uh, hemoglobin molecule that's going to ultimately affect the shape of the cell. Um, so in this one, one amino acid is wrong in the chain of the protein. Um, so that's going to completely change the shape of the cells into this crescent or sickle shaped. Right? Um, so these misshapen red blood cells are more easily to rupture or block small blood vessels. Um, so end result is poor oxygen delivery um, and some pain. Right? So this goes back to the structure reflects the function. So we said the shape of the blood cell is very conducive to its role in gas transport. So the biconcave shape, right? the arrangement of the hemoglobin. So in a sickle cell, blood cell, we don't have that same shape, so we're not going to be able to transport the oxygen as efficiently. So sickle cell anemia is um, mo most prevalent in black people of African descendants. Um, so the theory on why sickle cell anemia seems to persist in these African populations is that it possible benefit of having these sickle shaped uh, red blood cells is that it makes the um, individual kind of immune to malaria. So malaria is a very big problem in Africa, kills over a million people each year. Um, but what happens is the malarial parasite attacks the red blood cells. So the sickle shape of those blood cells prevents the malarial parasite from uh, infecting the person. Another type of erythrocyte disorder is polycythemia. This would be an abnormal excess of red blood cells. So we have too many red blood cells. It's going to increase the uh, blood viscosity or thickness, making it more sluggish uh, blood flow. Polycythemia vera is a bone marrow cancer that leads to production of excess red blood cells. Um, so in these cases, hematocrit may go as high as 80%. Um, so the bone marrow cancer or tumor is stimulating, overstimulating those hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. So they're producing more red blood cells than is needed. Um, a secondary polycythemia could be caused by just low oxygen levels or an increase in erythropoietin production. So leukocytes, general structure and functional characteristics. So leukocytes are the white blood cells. So again, we said these are the only of the formed elements that are complete cells that have a nucleus and organelles. Right? But they're only going to make up a very small fraction of total blood volume, less than 1%. Um, and their function is in defense against disease and infection. So again, these are the cells of the immune system. Um, and they're also a little bit unique from the other formed elements in that they're capable of leaving the capillaries. So you can enter into the tissue spaces um, to help fight off infections. So the process where the cells can leave the capillaries is called diapedesis. Um, and then they're going to move through the tissue spaces by chemotaxis. So um, when you get an injury, those injured cells are going to send off kind of alarm chemicals that these white blood cells are able to detect and move toward those signals. So leukocytosis would be a white blood cell count over 11,000 per microliter. Um, so it's an increase in white blood cells would be a normal response to an infection. So if you have an infection, you're going to need more white blood cells to help fight it off.
So we group leukocytes into two major categories, depending on whether or not they have visible cytoplasmic granules. So the granulocytes do have visible granules. The agranulocytes do not. Uh, so one little mnemonic to help you remember the white blood cells in order from most to least abundant. Uh, never let monkeys eat bananas. Right? So neutrophils would be our most prevalent, right? then lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and bananas. Right. So again, this is showing the general percentages of each type of leukocyte. So again, the neutrophils are the most prevalent, the most common of the white blood cells. Right. The basophils are the least abundant. Right. So these are the bananas. So the granulocytes, there are three types, the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. So one way to remember um, which are granulocytes and which are agranulocytes, all of the fills are your granulocytes. So these have, um, these are larger cells but also shorter lived than the red blood cells and they contain lobed nuclei. Um, so their granules will stain um, kind of a purplish, light purple, um, with right stain. Uh, and all of them are going to be phagocytic to some degree, meaning that all of them are going to eat something, or eat cells, um, one way or another. Okay. So the first one we'll look at are the neutrophils. These are the most abundant. Right, so 50 to 70 percent of all white blood cells. Um, so you see they're about twice the size of a red blood cell. Um, so the granules that you see, so these little specks in the cytoplasm um, are going to contain some hydrolytic enzymes or antimicrobial proteins called defensins. So they're um, going to help defend the cell against infections. Okay. Um, and it has a multi-lobed nucleus. So we have one, two, three lobes um, in this neutrophil nucleus. So neutrophils are very phagocytic. They're referred to as the bacteria slayers. So as we go along, you'll see a lot of these uh, leukocytes kind of have their own specialty. They specialize in a certain type of pathogen or infection. So neutrophils specialize in bacteria. So these defense in granules are um, enzymes in the granules that they release are going to kind of spear or pierce holes in the cell membrane of the microbe. Eosinophils are going to account for 2 to 4 percent of all leukocytes. Um, they have a bilobed nucleus, so they only have two lobes in their nucleus. Um, and their granules stain a little bit more red. Um, so these red staining uh, granules are going to contain digestive enzymes that work on large parasitic worms right, to digest them from the surface. So eosinophils specialize in parasitic worms. So a lot of um, pathogens, things like bacteria and viruses, are smaller than our own cells. So we're, our cells are able to kind of engulf or you know, take care of them. But with a parasitic worm, you're dealing with a large organism. So we attack them from the outside. Right? So we kind of attack them, digest them from the outside in. Basophils, so again, these are the most rare. So these are the bananas. Um, so these granules stain kind of a dark, deep purple. Um, and their granules are going to contain histamine. So histamine is an inflammatory chemical that's going to act as a vasodilator and help to attract white blood cells to um, the injured areas. So if you've taken an antihistamine before, so when you get um, allergies, right, so your sinuses are inflamed from your allergies, so you would take an antihistamine. So the agranulocytes are going to not have any visible granules. So there's only two types um, of agranulocytes. And again, one way to remember which ones are the agranulocytes right, are the sites. Okay. 
So granulocytes are the fills and agranulocytes are the sites. Okay. Um, so both of these would have a spherical or kidney shaped nucleus. So they don't have lobed nuclei like the granulocytes do. Right, so the first one we'll look at are the lymphocytes. So these are the second most abundant. Um, so these have a large dark purple circular nuclei which is a thin rim of like light blue cytoplasm. So these are mostly found in lymphoid tissue. Um, so things like the lymph nodes, the spleen, um, but there are a few that circulate throughout the blood. Um, so these cells are probably the most crucial to our immune system. So we'll talk about these guys a whole lot more in depth in the immune system chapter. But for now, just know there's two types of lymphocytes. So there are T cells. Um, so these are going to act against virus infected cells and tumor cells, right, or intracellular um, parasites. B cells or B lymphocytes are going to form plasma cells that produce antibodies. So these are going to attack things on the surface of the cell. Right, so monocytes are our last one. So these are the largest of all the leukocytes. Um, so they have that kidney or U-shaped nucleus. So these guys are able to um, leave the circulation, enter the tissue spaces, and become macrophages. So macrophages, phage just means to eat. Macro means large. So these are large eating cells. So they're actively phagocytic that are going to go through and eat um, anything like viruses, bacterial parasites, um, and infected cells. They also work to help activate the lymphocytes to mount a coordinated immune response. So leukopoiesis is the production of white blood cells and it's stimulated by two types of chemical messengers from the red bone marrow and from other mature white blood cells. Um, so interleukins and colony stimulating factors um, are going to be messengers to tell the red bone marrow when it's time to make more uh, white blood cells. So all leukocytes originate from that hematopoietic stem cell or hemocytoblast. Um, but then from there it's going to branch into two different pathways. Right? So if it's a lymphoid stem cell it's going to produce lymphocytes and if it's a myeloid stem cell it's going to produce all the other formed elements. So typically we produce three times as many white blood cells as red blood cells because they have a shorter lifespan that they're going to die fighting off infections and pathogens. Where red blood cells only have to transport gas, white blood cells have a little bit more dangerous life and a shorter lifespan. So this is showing the pathway of development for different types of blood cells. So they're all going to begin with this hematopoietic stem cell and then from there diverge either into a myeloid or a lymphoid stem cell. Right? So your lymphoid stem cells produce only the lymphocytes, so T cells and B cells. Myeloid stem cells go on to form all the other formed elements, all the other types of white blood cells. So an overproduction of abnormal white blood cells could lead to things like leukemias or infectious mononucleosis. Um, an abnormally low white blood cell count is called leukopenia. So this can be drug induced, um, particularly anti-cancer drugs or glucocorticoids. So people that um, again maybe had an organ transplant, we want to kind of suppress their immune system, um, we can do that with drugs. So leukemia is a cancerous condition involving overproduction of abnormal white blood cells. Uh, so they're named according to which white blood cell um, is involved. So myeloid leukemia involves all of its descendants. A lymphocytic leukemia would involve just the lymphocytes. Okay, so platelets are our last formed element that we'll look at and they're 
actually just fragments of a larger cell that has been ruptured. Okay. Um, so the function of platelets is just to form a temporary platelet plug and help seal breaks in blood vessels. Um, and because they're only cell fragments, they have very short lifespan, they age quickly, and start to degenerate in about 10 days. Okay, so summary of all the formed elements we've looked at. So we had the erythrocytes or the red blood cells. Right? So their function is to transport gases, nutrients, waste, um, and hormones. The leukocytes were the white blood cells that consisted of the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. Right? So the granulocytes include all of the fills. Right? So neutrophils are your bacteria specialists. Eosinophil are going to specialize in parasitic worms. Basophils release histamine and other um, kind of inflammatory chemicals. Okay. Lymphocytes and monocytes are your A granulocytes. Okay, so the site, site. So the lymphocytes are going to be our primary immune cells that mount the immune response um, either by attacking infected cells or making antibodies. Right. Monocytes are the large. Um, leukocytes with the U-shaped nuclei that are going to become macrophages. Um, and then finally, platelets are these cellular fragments, cytoplasmic fragments, um, that's going to help with blood clotting. All right, so this next section looks at hemostasis. Right, hemostasis is the series of reactions for stopping bleeding. So it's going to require lots of different clotting factors and substances released by the platelets and the injured tissues. So there's three steps involved that we'll look at, starting with vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, and coagulation. So vascular spasm, right, so after initial injury, the smooth muscle of the blood vessel wall is going to contract. We're going to try to close off that blood vessel and constrict it to slow down or stop the bleeding. Platelet plug formation where, where the platelets start to stick to the exposed collagen fibers of the injured vessel um, and they're going to release chemicals to attract more platelets. They get more sticky um, and more platelets come to the area until eventually we have a platelet plug form. And then the third step with coagulation, we have um, protein fibers called fibrin that's going to form kind of like a mesh or a net to trap the red blood cells and platelets and form the clot. Hmm. So again, vascular spasm is where the vessel is going to respond to an injury with vasoconstriction. So this can be triggered by direct injury to the vascular smooth muscle or it could also be triggered by chemicals released by those endothelial cells and platelets, as well as pain reflexes. Um, so obviously this would be more effective in smaller blood vessels, so they're going to be easier to close off. Um, but it helps to significantly reduce the blood flow until our other mechanisms have time to kick in. So step two, platelet plug formation. The platelets are going to start to stick to those exposed collagen fibers. Um, so normally platelets aren't going to stick to an intact vessel wall because those collagen fibers aren't exposed. So once the platelets become activated, they'll swell, get kind of spiky um, and sticky, and they're going to release chemical messengers to attract more platelets to stick to the area. Um, so this is a positive feedback cycle. So we talked a lot about negative feedback with the endocrine system chapter. So positive feedback would be where we don't want to turn off the effect. We want more and more of that same effect. So you think of positive feedback cycle kind of like a snowball effect. So we're going to have more and more platelets um, come to the area to stick and then release more chemicals which attract more platelets. Right? So these platelet plugs are fine for smaller vessel tears, but anything larger um, is going to require an additional step. So coagulation is essentially blood clotting. Um, so this is going to help to reinforce the platelet plug with the fibrin threads. 
Um, and it's going to be very effective in sealing those larger vessel breaks. So the blood is going to be transformed from its normal liquid consistency to more of a gel-like um, substance. So there's a series of reactions using different clotting factors, um, like those plasma proteins in the blood, um, that are going to contribute to this coagulation process. Right? So coagulation occurs in three phases that we will look at. So phase one of coagulation, um, we have to get prothrombin activator. Right? So there's two pathways we can go to get to this prothrombin activator. Um, so the intrinsic pathway or the extrinsic pathway. Right? Um, so these are typically going to be caused or triggered by some type of tissue damaging event um, and involve series of these procoagulants or these um, clotting factors. So the intrinsic pathway is called intrinsic because everything we need to form a blood clot is already present within the blood. Um, so this could be triggered by negatively charged surfaces such as those activated platelets, um, the collagen fibers that have been exposed, um, even the glass of a test tube. So if we leave blood in a test tube for a little while, um, around the edge of the glass it will start to thicken up um, and try to coagulate. The extrinsic pathway um, would be where the factors needed for clotting are outside the blood. Um, so this is triggered by exposure to tissue factor. Um, so when the tissues are damaged, they release their own kind of alarm chemical that can initiate this extrinsic pathway. Um, so it's able to bypass several steps of the intrinsic pathway, so it's a much faster route to get to that prothrombin activator. Okay, so this figure is showing the um, intrinsic and extrinsic pathway side by side. So again, intrinsic, all of the necessary clotting factors are already present within the blood. Um, so we have to go through all these different steps. You don't need to know all of these. Um, just know that the end result is we now have prothrombin activator. So with the extrinsic pathway um, being exposed to tissue factor, we bypass a lot of these steps. So we kind of take a shortcut to get to that same end result of the prothrombin activator. So phase two of coagulation um, is the pathway to thrombin. So that prothrombin activator that we got in phase one is going to catalyze the transformation of another enzyme called prothrombin to the active form of the enzyme called thrombin. So this will be the same no matter if we do the intrinsic or extrinsic pathway. So everything after phase one um, is going to be the same. Phase three, so now we have our common pathway to the fibrin mesh. So that thrombin that we just got from phase two is going to convert the uh, protein fibrinogen to fibrin. So these fibrin strands are what's going to form the structural basis of the clot. So it forms um, kind of like a net or a gel-like trap to catch more formed elements, more cells, more platelets. Um, so this thrombin, as it activates the uh, clotting factor, is going to help form crosslinks of those fibrin strands um, and strengthen and stabilize the clot. So once we form the clot, we don't want it to float away. We want it to be stable and firmly attached to that break. Um, so something that's an anticoagulant would be a factor that normally um, would inhibit coagulation. So we only want our blood to clot at certain times. Right? So we also produce some anticoagulants to prevent undesirable clot formation. Okay. So here's that phase three. So thrombin is going to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So the fibrin and that last clotting factor 13 um, is going to allow those fibrin strands to form cross links um, and that mesh structure. Right, and now we have the whole process from start to finish. So again, in, intrinsic, right, everything is already present within the blood. 
extrinsic, we've exposed um, the blood to tissue factor, which is going to speed up this process. Right, so if the blood's exposed to tissue factor, that means that it's more than likely a more serious injury or trauma to damage the tissue. Um, so we need a faster response time. Right, so prothrombin activator is going to activate prothrombin into thrombin. Thrombin activates fibrinogen into fibrin and helps form that cross-linked uh, fibrin mesh. So here is an actual picture of a blood clot. So you see all these strands are the fibrin, part of that fibrin mesh, and how it traps all of these blood cells to form our clot. So once the clot's been formed, it has to be stabilized um, and then later removed once the damage has been repaired. So clot retraction, um, the actin and myosin in the platelets are going to contract within the first hour. So just like the actin and myosin we talked about in skeletal muscle and anatomy one, so those filaments that shorten, um, they're going to work the same way here in that they're going to shorten their length to contract those platelets. So during the contraction we're pulling on those fibrin strands and we're going to squeeze out any excess serum and fluid from the clot. And it's also going to help to draw the damaged blood vessel edges back together so that they can repair themselves. So the blood vessel begins the healing process even as clot retraction is occurring. Um, so the platelets are going to release what's called platelet-derived growth factor. That's going to stimulate division of the smooth muscle cells to re start rebuilding that blood vessel wall. Um, another growth factor called vascular endothelial growth factor is going to stimulate the endothelial cells to multiply and restore that lining inside the blood vessel. So once the bleeding has stopped, the damage has been repaired, right? So the clot has served its purpose. We no longer need it. So then we get to fibrinolysis. So again, lysis means to split or break apart something. So we're breaking apart this fibrin mesh clot. So um, this process begins about two days after the initial injury and can continue for several days until the clot is completely dissolved. Um, so plasminogen is a plasma protein that's trapped in the clot uh, and it's going to be converted to plasmin which is an enzyme to digest these fibrin strands. So it's going to eat and snip all of these fibrin strands to free up the other cells and things that were trapped in the mesh and clear up the clot. So there's two major types of disorders of hemostasis we may see. Um, so one type being a thromboembolic disorder, which would result in an undesirable clot formation, um, and bleeding disorders, which prevent normal clot formation. So either we're making clots when we don't need to, or we're unable to make clots when we do need to. So thromboembolic conditions include things like thrombus and an embolus. So thrombus would be the clot that develops in an unbroken blood vessel. So it's pretty stationary um, in that unbroken vessel. So it can block circulation and lead to tissue death. Um, so occasionally a piece of this clot breaks off and that's when we would have an embolus. So now a piece of that clot is freely floating through the bloodstream. So eventually it may encounter a small vessel that it's not able to pass through and then it would become an embolism. So an embolism would be um, a vessel obstruction by a blood clot. Um, so some risk factors for these kind of conditions include atherosclerosis, inflammation, slowly flowing blood, or blood stasis from immobility. Um, so this is why in hospitals, after a patient has surgery, they want to get them up and walking as soon as possible to prevent the formation of blood clots. So we can use some anticoagulant drugs to help prevent these undesirable clot formations. Um, so things like aspirin, heparin, warfarin, um, 
are all going to be used to kind of thin the blood and prevent that undesirable uh, clot from forming. Thrombocytopenia is another type of bleeding disorder where a person would have a deficient number of circulating platelets. So they're not able to form um, blood clots as well as they need to. Um, so this could present with petechial hemorrhaging, so little uh, like small red specks, um, little blood clots, little bleeding um, under the skin. So this thrombocytopenia can be due to suppression or destruction of the bone marrow since platelets are also derived from the bone marrow and would be treated with just a transfusion of concentrated platelets. Um, another type of bleeding disorder may be caused just by impaired liver function. So remember, the liver synthesizes most of those blood clotting factors, those procoagulants. Um, so causes could include vitamin K deficiency, hepatitis, or cirrhosis. Um, so liver disease can also prevent the liver from producing bile, um, which is needed to absorb fat and vitamin K. Hemophilia is a group of hereditary bleeding disorders um, where generally one or more of those clotting factors are missing or deficient. Um, so symptoms include prolonged bleeding, especially into the joint cavities. Um, so treatment would include injections of genetically engineered factors, blood clotting factors. Um, a new treatment they're looking at is gene therapy where they actually replace the defective gene um, that's coded for that deficient or defective clotting factor. So the cardiovascular system is going to work to minimize the effects of blood loss either by reducing blood volume of the affected blood vessels or ramping up production of the red blood cells. However, the body is only able to compensate for so much blood loss. Um, after 15 to 30 percent loss um, can cause pallor um, or pale complexion, um, weakness, fatigue, um, loss of more than 30% would result in a potentially fatal circulatory shock. So when we're transfusing blood cells, we have to um, look at the blood groups. So whole blood transfusions are used only when the blood loss is rapid and substantial. So when the person's losing blood faster than they can replace it, right, we'll have to undergo a blood transfusion. So typically infusions would include packed red blood cells um, so that we can rapidly restore that oxygen carrying capacity. Um, so when you donate blood, the blood banks usually are going to separate it into its components. Um, so some people get pl uh, platelets transfused, some people get just red blood cells, some people get plasma, you know, those plasma proteins donated. Um, but the shelf life of blood is only about 35 days. So again, we have to determine the blood groups of donated blood because transfusion reactions can be fatal. So we do this by blood typing. So the human blood groups are denoted by the antigens on the red blood cell surface. Um, so an antigen is anything perceived as foreign that can generate an immune response. So antigen is short for antibody generating. So anything that um, the immune system perceives as foreign is going to try to make antibodies against it. So in uh, blood typing, the red blood cell antigens are sometimes referred to as agglutinogens or agglutinogens because they promote agglutination. So agglutination is just a big word to say clotting. Right? So if we have mismatched blood transfusions, um, then that will be perceived as foreign and it may be agglutinated or clumped and destroyed, which can cause potentially fatal reaction. So humans have over 30 occurring antigens, um, but there's really only three that we focus on in blood typing. 
So the presence or absence of these antigens is used to classify the blood cells into three different groups. Um, so we have the ABO and RH blood groups. Um, so these are the ones that are majorly um, going to be tight because they cause the most vigorous transfusion reactions. So again, these blood groups are based on either the presence or absence of these antigens on the surface of the red blood cell. So for example, type A blood would only have the A antigen. Right? Type B would have the type B antigen. Type AB has both A and B antigens. Right? Um, type O has neither. So it's basically like a naked cell. It doesn't have any antigens on its surface. Um, so these blood types may also contain preformed antibodies against the other blood types. So anti-A or anti-B. Um, so these antibodies are sometimes called agglutinins. Um, so they're going to act against any transfused red blood cells um, that have antigens not present on um, your blood cells. Um, so anti-A or anti-B form in the blood about two months of age, um, reaching adult levels by eight to ten years. So on this table we have the ABO blood groups um, and their antigens and their antibodies. So blood group AB has both A and B antigens on its surface. So antigens are basically just like protein, so think they're proteins on the surface. Um, that allow us to identify these different types. So because they have both antigens, they don't have any antibodies. Right? B-type blood only has the B antigens, and it would have anti-A antibodies. So think we're always anti what we're not. So if we're B blood, then we're anti-A. So again, these anti-A antibodies, if, say, someone with AB blood donated to this person with B blood, these anti-A antibodies are going to attach to these A antigens and cause these blood cells to clump together. Okay. Type A blood only have the A antigens, right? and they have anti-B antibodies. Right. So again, if someone with B-type blood donated to someone with A blood, these anti-B antibodies are going to bind to the B antigens and cause clumping. Right. Um, O-type blood has no antigen, so they are essentially naked blood cells. So because they don't have A or B antigens, they do have both antibodies. So they're anti-A and anti-B. Right. So we're always anti what we're not. Okay. Um, so because they don't have any antigens on the surface of their cell, they wouldn't cause a reaction if they were to donate to any of the other blood types. So this is why uh, blood type O is called the universal donor. Um, AB blood, since it doesn't have any antibodies um, that would react with blood, it's the universal recipient. Because it has both antigens, it can receive A or B or O blood. So the last blood group is the RH blood group. So sometimes it's called the D antigen, uh, but typically we'll denote it as either positive or negative. So instead of adding another letter, so instead of having ABD blood, we would have AB positive blood. So roughly 85% of Americans are RH positive. Um, but one difference with the RH antigen is that anti-RH antibodies are not spontaneously formed like the anti-A and anti-BR. Anti-RH antibodies can only form um, after an exposure of an RH negative individual um, exposed to RH positive blood. Okay. Or if an RH negative mother is carrying RH positive fetus. We'll talk about in just a second. Um, so typically it's the second exposure to that RH positive blood that's going to result in your transfusion reaction after we have the antibody. So the first reaction um, we don't, or the first exposure we don't have a reaction because we don't have those antibodies present. 
But after that exposure, we make the antibody. So the second time we're exposed to it, we now have those antibodies ready to go. That will result in that clumping of the blood cells. Um, so one type of homeostatic imbalance with blood types um, is hemolytic disease of the newborn, sometimes also called erythroblastosis fatalis. So this would occur when an Rh negative mother has an Rh positive baby. So in her first pregnancy, the Rh negative mother is exposed to the blood of the baby during delivery. So that first baby would be born healthy, but the mother is then going to start to synthesize those anti-RH antibodies. So her second pregnancy now that she has those antibodies present, they're able to cross the placenta and they can attack the red blood cells of the RH positive baby. Um, so the baby would have to be treated with pre-birth transfusions um, and after birth transfusions. Uh, but now it's something that uh, doctors test for, they look for um, ahead of time, um, and can be um, prevented with a Rogam serum. So it contains anti-RH that can prevent that RH negative mother from becoming sensitized um, to that RH positive. So this diagram just showing how this hemolytic disease of the newborn works. So we have an RH positive father with an RH negative mother. So she's carrying an RH positive baby. So during delivery, some of uh, the mother's going to be exposed to that RH positive blood from the baby and her body's going to respond by producing these anti-RH antibodies. So upon her second pregnancy with an RH positive fetus, now these antibodies that are present can cross the placenta and damage the fetal red blood cells. So transfusion reactions occur if mismatched blood is infused. Um, so the donor cells are going to be attacked by the recipient's plasma um, antigens or antibodies. Um, so this can cause clumping, which can uh, clog small blood vessels um, and can also cause the blood cells to rupture and release that hemoglobin and iron into the bloodstream. So end result would be diminished oxygen carrying capacity because we've damaged and destroyed our blood cells. We have decreased blood flow because now the blood vessel has been blocked by all of these blood clots. Um, and the hemoglobin and the iron in the kidney tubules can actually lead to renal failure. So the kidneys can get overloaded trying to filter out all of the hemoglobin, protein, and iron um, from the blood. So some symptoms of a transfusion reaction would be nausea, chills, low blood pressure, rapid heart rate, nausea, vomiting. Um, so one of the primary treatments would be to prevent kidney damage. So they'll flush fluids. Um, to kind of try to wash out the hemoglobin um, and with diuretics. So again, type O we said was universal donor because they have no antigens, they have naked cells. Type AB is a universal recipient because they have no antibodies that would react with um, any other blood type. So sometimes a patient can do an autologous transfusion, which would be where they pre-donate their own blood um, so it's stored and available if needed. So maybe after a big surgery, if they know that there might be potential for lots of bleeding, the patient might go ahead and pre-donate some of their own blood um, so we don't have to worry about transfusion reactions. So when we do blood typing, we have to mix the uh, donor blood with antibodies. Right? Um, and you'll get to do this in lab this semester. Um, you'll get to type your own blood. Right? So basically, if that antigen is present, then we should see some clumping occur right, with the blood. Um, so we can test for A, B, O, and RH factor all in the same manner, in the same test. Um, so then we would do cross-matching to uh, between specific donor and specific recipients. Right, so this is showing how the blood typing works. So this will be just how we do it in lab. Right, so 
The serum, so we've added anti-A antibody serum and anti-B antibody serum. Right, so this person is type AB because we have reaction and clumping with both sections. Right? Um, and we could do the same thing if we added a third drop of blood here and we could add anti-RH to see if the person is RH positive or negative. Okay, so type A, you see, only has a reaction with the anti-A. So this means that this person's blood cells have the A antigen on their surface. Uh, they do not have the B antigens because there's no reaction. So same thing with type B. They do have the B antigen, so this is where we see a reaction. There's no A antigens on these cells, so there's no reaction with anti-A antibodies. And again, type O, because they have no antigens, they're not going to have any reaction to either antibody. So examination of blood can yield information on a person's health. So things like a low hematocrit could uh, tell us that someone has anemia. Right? Blood glucose could check for diabetes. Leukocytosis or an overabundance of white blood cells could tell us there's some type of infection. Right? Also, the um, microscopic examination of blood, just the physical shape of the blood cells can reveal some uh, disorders. So things like anemia, sickle cell, right? uh, infections, uh, cancers, the, um, yeah, can all change the shape, size, color, and uh, structure of the blood cells. So a few di diagnostic blood tests you may see. Um, a differential white blood cell count looks at the relative proportions of each white blood cell. So increases in specific type of leukocyte can help with the diagnosis. So example, if we have an overabundance of eosinophils, right, and we know that eosinophils specialize in parasitic worms. So if there's an abundance of these eosinophils, then that could tell us that maybe the patient has a parasitic infection. Um, or if they have a lot of neutrophils, right? Neutrophils are bacterial specialists, so this could tell us there's a bacterial infection. Um, Prothrombin time, platelet counts, they can assess hemostasis or stopping of bleeding, blood clotting. Uh, comprehensive medical panel, CMP, looks at blood chemistry, so we check for various blood chemical levels, um, certain ions, and things in the blood. Uh, complete blood count checks all the formed elements, the hematocrit and the hemoglobin, give us kind of a whole picture of uh, someone's health.